Shani, you joined the LA Times. Well, let's start with this. <laughs> Deputy Man Managing Editor of News at the Los Angeles Times. Uh -huh. What does that mean? What's your role? Uh, there are a few of us, but my role is essentially overseeing most of our news departments. Um, our California Division, Washington 2020, business, uh, investigations, and obituaries. So all, you deal with all the pain in the ass as a journalist. I love them. OK. Um, <laughs> great. I'm one of them, I think. Um, Pam, uh, what can you describe? I know, I know going through the, the merger with, uh, with Vox Media right now and the integ integrations, uh, besides dealing with all of that, what, it, what is your role entail? Uh, well, it's, I'm about two weeks into it. Um, <laughs> we closed our deal two weeks ago. Okay. And thank you. It's very exciting. Um, so a lot is still, you know, integration, but um, I'm managing the legacy New York media editorial team and um, some of the growth business lines in the combined business. So commerce and subscription and just generally, you know, helping to build a um, pretty exciting media business. And Leandra, um, I th there are definitely people in the room who know Man Repeller. I know there are people on our staff who were very excited that Man Repeller was going to be on stage here. For those who don't know Man Repeller, what is, what is your brief description of what it's you have built over the last eight years? Community first media brand that was born out of a celebration of trends that women love and men hate. All right. Um, it did get me married. It did get you married, OK. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, Shani, I want, I want to start with you and um, the topic of subscriptions. So you joined from BuzzFeed mm -hmm. this summer. Around the time you joined the LA Times, you walk into a situation where um, there had previously been an announcement that the company want, expected to go from 150,000 digital subscriptions to 300,000 by the end of this year. Um, halfway through the year, um, that number had not gotten very far. Um, why is that? Oh, that's so an easy question. Yes. <laughs> uh, so I think to reverse a little bit, something that you know, I, I'd been at BuzzFeed for six years, and I it was not a subscription business. Now there's a really wonderful membership business. You should join. You should also become a subscriber to LA Times, but. Uh, I didn't really know that much about subscriptions. And so something that people would ask me about, I would say about a week to three weeks into me starting, is like, what are you most surprised by here? And I'm like, well, journalists are all the same. So it's like, you guys are not that surprising to me. But what has been surprising is just the number of things that we still needed to untangle from the Tribune company. I think, you know, a month or two after I started, we, had, we finally emailed, uh, migrated our email servers off of Tronk. This week, we are finally migrating our expenses out of Tribune. So it's like this very slow but steady hundreds of things that had to be untangled. And I think we After the sale to, to your now billionaire owner in right. 2018. Right. So okay. we had, it had been more than a year since we had been sold when I started. So you know, I think we just had not anticipated how much that stuff was going to take up time. And so the, the challenge on the subscription side for you, you're talking about sort of technology, yeah. I mean, being infrastructure. Able to, being able to email your subscribers. We couldn't do that when I started. Whoa. Um, like literally could Literally not. could not email our subscribers. Um, that sounds like not a good plan to grow your yeah. subscribers. Well, now we can, so it's great. Um, <laughs> from the editorial point of view, yeah. who should be a subscriber to the LA Times? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, besides everybody, I think that uh, obviously, we do a lot of work in Southern California. We do a lot of um, journalism that just doesn't exist in California now because of the way that our industry has been decimated here. Um, I'm from California, and you know, I've been away for a long time. But coming back, I just, you know, the papers that I thought I could potentially work at either don't exist or are such a shell of their former selves that it's it's really distressing. But we're able to sort of with a pretty robust although not as robust as it used to be, um, Metro team, we're able to tell people what's actually happening here. Uh, I think that we are really good at explaining our state to the rest of the world and showing the ways that our, our state is in conflict with 
President Trump, with other countries. I mean, it's in a massive economy. So I think if you're interested in the way the global economy moves, you should subscribe. If you're interested in politics of any level, you should subscribe because some of you know, the most controversial politicians come out of our state. Um, yeah. I think ev like everybody, Jason. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna come back to everybody <laughs> subscribing to the LA Times, but I do have this yeah. question from afar: of Are you a, is this are you a national publication? Are you a global publication? Are you a California publication? And can you, like, can you be multiple things? It sounds like you've been hiding under the conference table in our executive meeting. I I, I have been, and that's why I'm gonna keep following up on this. Pam, I um, about a year ago, New York Media. Um, I think I have my timeline right, introduced a digital subscription yep. that covers New York Magazine, but also some of your web properties. Um, there's Grub Street, The Cut, uh, Strategist, Vulture. I'm, I may be missing. Strategist isn't in the paywall. Isn't in the paywall. And we're going right. to talk about that because so you make money a different way. The Cut, way. Vulture, Grub Street, and Intelligencer. It, was this a strategy where print subscriptions are going this way, and so we need the digital sub subscription to work to have a future? Or what was the strategy with, with the digital? No, life? it's really, it's incremental. I mean, we've had over the last couple of years a um, revenue diversification strategy, and we looked at you know, the businesses that we can create that are organic and closely tied to the product that we produce, which is, you know, a premium high quality journalism around a certain like voice and sensibility. So um, subscription, you know, that is a an experience that um, audiences will pay for. And we we know that from having a long time print subscription business and had the confidence that um, what we're doing on other platforms and digitally and the brands that we've built, like The Cut and Vulture, et cetera, um, are also products that audience will pay for. So this is a paywall, or how did... It's a, when, it's a, when will you hit this? It's a um, dynamic metered paywall. Which means? Which means that instead of um, a fixed meter, like you read three articles and for free and then the fourth you have to pay, um, you're going to encounter our meter at a different place in your um, customer journey, depending on the kind of um, the kind of content that you're consuming, and and like where you're um, coming from in some cases, or if you are reading um, magazine like features versus TV recaps. So you'll. You know, we're, we're basically, we tried to align the product um, in a not sort of insane 70 variables kind of way, um, align the product with our expectation of what consumers will perceive to be an appropriate value exchange. Shani was complaining backstage about hitting <laughs> wow. the paywall and being really, really pissed about that. So. that. That was not complaining. It was not pissed. Oh. I'm but sure I, she was thrilled to hit the paywall well, because she was like, wow, this is an amazing product. Can I support it with my money, please? Well, I, I subscribe in print, <laughs> so I, I, I need to link so my get subscription. It for free. Yeah. Like, you know, I know it's that, like that kind of friction. And this is this <laughs> is five this is five dollars a month. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Um, how many subscribers? Do you have? We haven't said publicly how many subscribers, but we're excited. This is about... like half public, kind of private. It's so... pretty public. Okay. <laughs> the, um, but only... I will say, like, we um, have been encouraged by the number of subscribers, especially because we started the wall. Um, pretty loose in terms of like you really had to be reading deeply. Um, we wanted to make sure we built the technology ourselves um, rather than outsourcing that. We already had a custom um, CMS pub publishing technology and so we built the subscription capabilities into it. And um, when we launched, like wanted to make sure that we were getting the experience right. And, um, and we've been over the last year the mission has really been about like testing and learning and kind of making sure that the um, customer experience is as good as it can be. We've learned a ton, including you know customer service when you're selling online is very different than customer service for a print subscription. And so we um, like you have to have customer service. Correct. Yes. Okay. So you know, lesson learned. We have customer service now. 
I want to know if Recode's going to end up being a part of um, uh, the subscription service or not. Peter already said no on stage, but I think that may have been his Facebook moment where he says something on stage <laughs> that he has to walk back, so we'll get to that. But um, uh, hi, Peter. Uh, Leandra, no subscription at Man Repeller. You have an audience of about 2 million people a month, right? Mm -hmm. Very, very devoted audience. Um, your business model up until now, you told me, was largely built around what some would call native advertising. Mm -hmm. um, next, but you're focused on new, a new revenue generating. Well, effectively revenue. inversing the model. What does that mean? We've done, we've become very well known for creating best in class experiences for the brands who we work with. And that has necessarily required a lot of turning down business in order to feel that our uh, like pursuits are aligned with these brands. And your staff is small. How many people? Yeah, we're 16 people. Yeah. And on editorial, uh, two staff writers, a managing editor, an executive editor, and me. What is your title? Um, I go by founder and chief creative officer, but when you're a 16-person company, there is no C-suite, so just founder. Yeah, and so, so you want to. So there's business you had to turn down. Well, did not have to, but decided early on we wanted to. I'm sorry, I have a scratchy throat, but um, uh, decided it made more sense to. And as we've been thinking about this next phase of growth and continuing to. Um, distill the sense of community that we've been able to generate and create this very, very meaningful dialogue that is often even more compelling than the stories themselves, we can't grow in the way of traditional digital media because it'll dilute the point of what we're building. Man Repeller might be considered a media brand, but I would say more than anything else, it uses media more as a tool. Um, and so as we're thinking about this next phase of growth, we're um, really thinking about using the lessons that we've learned to build our community and taking those to our partners and helping them build their own communities. So that would mean instead of, say, what I might consider native advertising on your property, what, what would the manifestation instead of your of work? Instead of coming to us as an amplification partner after you've already figured out your messaging, you're going to bring us into the sales cycle a lot earlier, and we're going to figure out the messaging together. Because often what ends up happening anyway is these brands come to us, we get on the phone with the brand, I'm like, this is a really shitty marketing strategy. Why don't we rework <laughs> it together? And I, I end up doing that legwork anyway. Um, so one thing that's interesting about this for to me is you you personally have... In, in the fashion world, a very big brand of your own. I mean, mm -hmm. if you just look at one metric like Instagram, almost a million followers there, Man Repeller brand, two million. And yet, the work you're talking about doing is, it sounds to me like behind, behind the scenes versus you, you and your brand out front. Mm -hmm. What, why? Am, am I understanding this correctly? It's we... not really behind the scenes because there is still the opportunity for amplification. And I often say that we're still going to look like a media company, but perhaps, at, not perhaps, just act a bit more like this creative services platform. We're doing so much of this work anyway. It's sort of just um, for, for, not really forcing, that's the wrong word also, but having the work level up to, um, having the scope of work level up to the way that we're working with, with the partners. Got it, okay. Um, Shani, uh, I'm not under your desk in your um, meetings right now, but um, I, I, to back to the point about who you're writing for and who the subscribers are, is there still an internal, sounds like there's still internal discussion or tension or push and pull around like what your sweet spot is and who are who are the core subscribers that are gonna get you from 160 something thousand today to your owner's goal is five million by some date that's not that long from now? I don't think you put a date. <laughs> okay, he didn't put a date. Uh, you know, 2021? I, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, so, so there are a couple things that are at play. So we know that Southern California readers are very quick to subscribe if we're giving them information that is really relevant to their lives. Um, we also know that that's sort of, that can in some ways be a little bit of a sugar high if you are focusing just on that group. 
um, you know, long-term strategy has to involve getting people from other parts of the country, other parts of the world, because other, I mean, the New York Times is a really great example. They've done an amazing job of sort of making their brand work um, for LA readers, you know, and so how do we do that? So I think for us, we want to obviously, we want everybody in Southern California who wants to know what's going on to subscribe to the LA Times, but we also want lots of other people who might be well served by us to also subscribe. So it's a, it is truly a balancing act, I would say. And do you, you know, you talk about the New York Times, big, big brands that have got, had success with subscriptions, New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal. Do you go head to head with them on politics and in journal business and win subscriptions that way? Or do you have to, I guess on the outside of California, like what is, what is the in that gets you those? I mean, I think that is like kind of exactly what I'm trying to figure out right now. <laughs> so I don't have a good answer for you other than, um, you know, we're not gonna win on sheer numbers in terms of staffing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we, we do get our, you know, our scoops when we can and, and play to win when we can, but um, it's a little bit of like, how do we get, how do we give people that we, that we that, how do we give people we, what they need? And so that's, that's the kind of open-ended question right now. Got it. And yeah. Pam, with the $5 a month subscri digital subscription, <laughs> Are you getting feedback on whether that you're giving enough to uh, that value exchange is right, or now with the combination with our my parent company, um, are you looking at, is there an opportunity or do you plan to try to roll in other brands and other content into a subscription? Uh, no plan to roll in other brands um, with regard to the Vox Media, other brands' portfolio. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think broadly in consumer revenue, um, one thing we've thought about at New York Media for years is like not just subscription per se, but consumer revenue opportunities. I think where you have um, an, a really engaged audience that's turning to you for authority or um, where you develop a relationship of habit, like there are that can generate a lot of um, different versions of consumer revenue opportunities, including something, by the way, like live events. Um, you know, same idea. So I, I don't, I don't think we make money off these events. I don't, I don't, I don't do that. That's a joke. That's a joke. <laughs> You're supposed to laugh. I know you guys paid ticket, paid good price for this. Um, so okay, so that. So um, in terms of the value exchange, like. Yeah, I think people um, are excited about the product, especially in in some ways what we're offering today is almost like a mini bundle in the sense like it does extend across multiple brands. Yeah. And, you know, so part of our job is to um, educate people who might be, for example, Vulture fans and less familiar with the cut that when they're getting Vulture and the cut, like they're getting something, you know, and they're like just, they're paying five dollars a month for Vulture. That these um, other, you know, products that they're receiving are also really valuable and um, help introduce a Vulture audience to the cut, for example, so that they're they'll have ultimately a higher propensity to subscribe because you know the more they see value in the complete package, the more. One of the areas that um, obviously there's overlap between my coverage area, which is e-commerce and media, is media companies playing in the commerce space in one way or the other. So there's the affiliate play, um, there's the companies that are actually, um, including your former employer, um, actually selling product play. Um, Leander, you, you have an affiliate business mm -hmm. at Man Repeller, um, which you said is, is sort of a smaller piece of the overall revenue pie. Mm -hmm. um, you also told me when we chatted briefly previously that uh, since you were friends with em Emily Weiss, who's the founder of Glossier, you often get people or maybe investors coming to you and say, what is, what is your Glossier play? Like, mm -hmm. what is your product play? Um, yes. You've done some collaborations with brands that specialize in making products, but you have not yourself, as far as I know, 
gone into selling products? Well, what, we've what? done a couple of experimental extensions of Man Repeller in the form of joyful accessory drops. Mm -hmm. We did one around last holiday um, and one this past summer, but they were both uh, very implicitly and explicitly br uh, branded as experimental extensions. It, it was um, really a testing period for us as we were thinking through how we were uh, going to effectively remodel um, and that and that was remodeled the business. Yeah. Or, okay. That that was sort of one thing I wanted to fold into our thesis. And what did you learn? Because it sounds like are you are you not going? Are those well, experiments? Well, I mean, I, I there were a lot of personal learnings. Like I love being in the business of selling ideas. Product is pretty tough, but um, by all means, it like it performed really well. Um, so that was definitely a big piece of it. Um, the work starts after the product is out there. You are not done. <laughs> and how you were selling through what? Through, through Shopify. Through Shopify. Yeah, this site is still up. I encourage anyone to take a look. It's actually a pretty incredible e-commerce experience that we built in-house uh, at shop.manrepeller.com. We can do but that for you in Man Repeller 2.0, too. For me personally or for me? Well, no, for okay. you as a brand. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> but... but just to be clear, but just, 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 great. I need I need all the help I can get. But just to be clear, this is this is something you will continue to experiment with, or are you are you not going to be in the business of of selling product? I would not. I would be hard pressed to say that we will be in the business of selling product, but there will continue to be uh, drops of merch over the course of the next several months, years. And is it a brand awareness thing, or is it, like, what's the goal of them? Yeah, it's a brand awareness thing to the extent that if <clears throat> manrepeller.com is, like, the religion that everyone is subscribing to, right, then wearing a product that's branded repeller is, like, the church where you go to pray. You see someone in repeller, you're like, oh, that person has, like, an interesting sensibility, wants to have a more in-depth conversation about fashion as it relates to their, like, sense of personal expression and their, you know, the inner workings of their guts. And so I know that we're going to get along. And we both probably like oat milk, too. I, 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 I don't know that I'd say I'd like it, but I just had some upstairs. It's really, so. it's, okay. it's a tremendous contribute. I mean, that's, that's really what we should be talking about up here. Like I where were, two stores again where were you during the great oat milk outage of 2018 <laughs> is what I'm still wondering. How many oat milk fans in the room? <laughs> OK. OK, that's about 30%. Um, we're going to take some questions in a minute. Um, uh, Pam, on the. Topic of commerce, um, New York Media and now Vox Media, I guess, operates Strategist, um, uh, which is a site where, well, let's, you describe it, and then I'll ask my lovely questions for you. Uh, the Strategist is a, um, I'm biased, but a really great product recommendation site. We took the uh, authority that New York Magazine had built up over 50 years in recommending um, great products to buy, you know, good deals, best bets, um, discovery is very much part of our um, part of our ethos, and so we applied all of that um, knowledge to shopping the internet smartly. So that's what the strategist and is. and the ca and the categories that are your sweet spot. Fashion, beauty, but also electronics and accessories. Electronics, uh, a lot of home design um, does really well for us. Like exercise equipment has been doing really well. Mattresses are always a big hit. And the model there, obviously, is someone clicks, they go and buy at a lot of times Amazon, but sometimes other places, mm -hmm. and you get you get a commission on that. Correct. Um, so something I think you haven't talked about publicly, but I, but I've learned is. Um, you know, Peter reported a couple months ago, Amazon is actually paying some publishers to expand into international markets. And I think they did that with the UK and the strategist. You're giving me a look that is like maybe a confirmation, but. We don't talk publicly about the terms of our relationships with partners. Um, okay. If, let's imagine there's a world where Amazon. There is a strategist UK that launched at the end of, uh, sorry, beginning of October. I, I am very interested in, you know, with the affiliate model in general, and maybe, Leandro, you have thoughts on this as well. Um, 
Amazon's a huge player in this space. Mm -hmm. um, in certain categories, the, the commissions they give now are great, but they decide those commissions when they want to, and maybe there's negotiation. Usually, uh, the word negotiation and Amazon doesn't go hand in hand. So how do you hedge against, in a growing business like commerce, how do you hedge against a reliance on one big player? I think um, you certainly try to work with multiple partners. Um, you try to maintain a very good relationship with your biggest partner. Um, and I think in the case of Amazon, they recognize the value that um, publishers like The Strategist are providing to them at the same time. So, you know, that's kind of the formula. And, and ultimately, like, you put out a um, product that is really compelling to audiences, that's growing really well, um, and that's, you know, has a great deal of journalistic integrity and authority that, um, you know, if, if there's any brand in the kind of product recommendation space that um, partners will get behind, that audiences will get behind, like, we, we want to be that. So that's our plan. Okay. Um, if we have any questions, please come up to the mic. I have a few more. Leandra, you said affiliate. I, so as a naive person looking at Man Repeller from the outside, I'd say, oh, there must be a huge opportunity for mm -hmm. uh, affiliate advertising and a commerce revenue. Um, why why is, that a, is that a strategic choice not to have that be a big part of the business? Or is there not a lot of stuff on Amazon you're, <laughs> you're recommending and they're the, they're the biggest player in the space? No, as we've really focused on nailing our um, formula for brand partnerships and the way that we work in an integrated capacity. The affiliate business is, rel it, it's not insignificant. It is a small piece of the pie, but it's not insignificant. And it's something that we will focus on a bit more in 2020 for sure. And but even even in the context of Amazon, um, though we work with them in an affiliate capacity, they're much better suited uh, uh, paying us to develop a marketing strategy for Amazon fashion, which has happened. Anyone from Am oh, I was, I was just going to ask if anyone from Amazon in the room, because you could do your pitch now, but it sounds <laughs> like they've already done that. Too. You don't need me. Um, Commerce and the LA Times. Uh, is the, and I know you're in an editorial role, but it, is that a discussion that comes up a lot and where there's opportunity? Uh, yeah, we talk about it. Um, I'm, I'm right now super focused on the journalism, so I have not been in many of those conversations, but uh, I'm very you know, intrigued by the potential for commerce. Um, I think two of you, LA Times and New York Media have done business with Apple through uh, Apple News Plus. Do I have that right? Yep. Um, what's, what, what sort of have you learned, if anything, yet on um, whether this is going to be you know, worth the time uh, financially? And then I don't know if there's any feedback you get um, editorially on, on what works there versus sort of with your, your direct-to-consumer business and cut customers? Um, well, you know, to echo Pam, I think that when you have a, a good partner, you spend a lot of time sort of communicating with them about what, what works best. Uh, you also can't ever compromise your editorial, um, your editorial sensibilities for a partner. Um, also to echo Pam, we don't discuss the terms of our deals. <laughs> Man, we're in, the, we're in the news business, right? Okay. Um, let me let me get these questions and then and then maybe I'll finish up. Um, yeah. Please just tell us who you are. Sure, Callie Hayes from Women's Red Daily. Um, I have a question for Shawnee and for Pam. So, Shawnee, I'm wondering where the majority of your revenue is coming from right now. If it is mostly subscriptions, and if you kind of have a date for when you'll be breaking even or profitable or not really needing injections from Patrick. And then for Pam, I'm wondering if there's any plans to cut down on the print schedule for New York Mag? Ow, she's gone. I can do mine first. <laughs> no plans to cut down on the print schedule. We publish bi-weekly. We'll continue to publish bi-weekly. Um, really proud of our print product. Yeah. I like it. That's why I asked. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so I would say that actually print 
is a huge driver of revenue for us, continues to be print subscriptions, just because of how much they cost. Um, and I think that a big part of what it's we're about, trying- Is it about 250 a year? Do I have that right? Um, I don't know. Okay. Well, I don't know. Okay, can't even fact check me. I think me. I pay like eight bucks a week or something. I get like the thing in my- Okay. I subscribe. So you should too. Uh, uh, so I think it's going to be, so essentially what we're trying to do is, as print, one, slow to, slow to decline of print, grow digital, and so hope they meet in the middle before advertising drops off the cliff. And so that's like, I don't have a date. I don't, like, it's just one of those things where it's just going to take us time, especially as we're continuing to do a lot of the, um, a lot of the sort of Tribune untangling that we're still continuing to do. Are you going to kind of evaluate it like quarter by quarter or year by year and just see where you are every time? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we have a great president and he's, and, and Patrick's also very involved and we're spending a lot of time just looking at kind of, obviously we would all like to make money sooner rather than later. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Hi, uh, Sabah Dilawari from LinkedIn. Um, just wanted to know from each of you or one or two of you, um, how you view community. I know for Man Repeller, community is a huge backbone of your brand. And then second part, um, just community, how, to, how you measure community. Is it just kind of by how many subscribers you have? Is it by the engagement on your articles or quality of comments? Um, can you just talk a little bit about that? Leandra, you want to start? Sure. Um, <clears throat> how we view community. It's sort of the lifeline of Man Repeller. Um, as I'd mentioned earlier, the conversations that occur under the stories tend to be more compelling even than the stories themselves. And it's definitely measured by depth of engagement. We've really never sold on a CPM basis. It's always been by time on site. And our time on site is pretty solid. Um, what it, do you know what it is on average? Three minutes and 47 seconds. I will say, Point. I looked the other day and I like, looked at like six posts. Oh, I'm so glad you did that. <laughs> I just kept clicking around. Yeah, well, I'm, we also And so you're selling that, that, you're selling that number or that engagement? That is, that is like the metric that comes up way more frequently, yes. Or that is like the only metric that comes up. Sorry, I interrupted. Yeah. But, you're finished. Um, but I, more than anything else, when I think about community, it's, it, it's more of an, it, it's a network more than anything else, right? Because the, the real value proposition and the thing that becomes incredibly lucrative is, is when it's able to self-sustain, when it's not just there um, to interact with or engage with something you're putting out there, but when it's, when it's feeding off of itself and just continuing to grow. And the best examples that we've seen of that thus far have been like the, the pretty uh, minor on in scalable terms, but significant in real life terms, relationships that have been built, like the 90% attendance rate on our events. Uh, we, we did a hotel, a hotel takeover at the end of 2018 um, at the Freehand in the Flatiron in New York, took over three floors there. And so many of the women that came to that event, it was open to 350 people, met each other in the comments, created rooms in the comments went on to live together and so on and so forth. It's, it's been um, pretty incredible to help adult women make friends at this phase in their life. And feels a lot, I'm going on a tangent now, but feels a lot like, um, the, the, like the minor but very significant way that a community is built. <clears throat> what, what's the, if you could pick one, uh, the most important way that you nurture like that community building, I mean, whether it's as simple as being active in the comments yes. or or making sure you're doing these in-person events, what, what would you choose? It's two ways. It's definitely being active in the comments, but it's also taking their comments seriously and having them impact the editorial calendar. Meaning that you take exact feedback and say, we should, we're going to now... Yeah, build it's, that it's, theme in, or, or? It, yeah, it's not as literal yeah. as you know someone commenting and being like, "Hey, this reminded me that you should also cover this in this capacity." But it, it is very, it's it's very circular in that way. Where if something goes up on investment shopping and the bulk of the comments are like, "None of these options are actually investments. What the hell is wrong with you guys?" Uh, the response to that is some version of a story that 
addresses the conversation that's happening. I mean, those, those are the conversations that really inform what we're putting out there. Because if, if our thesis is that we know what drives human behavior, then we have to actually mean it. And where better to aggregate that data than by looking at the way humans are behaving in our like, very robust comment section? It seems like a good way to wrap up, especially since Recode eliminated our comment section several years ago. So we should talk about that <laughs> backstage. Thank you to the three of you.